I think this is an interesting one. A way we have, uh, you know, too big to succeed is our little working title for our document. In, in a few different ways, right? Because obviously it's you know, big Bethesda game. I think now there's uh, a little bit more suspicion from people. Also too big to, you know, to succeed. Rather literally, the headline number of a thousand planets has got out there. And I think now we're in a situation where that has actually massively went past where I think Bethesda sees this into this new discourse that is dominating the game that basically comes down to it's like No Man's Sky, but it's more photoreal and boring. <laughs> uh, and that does not seem to have a tremendous amount of basis in most of how they've actually presented the overall game. Yeah, well. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, I think actually what they showed off was very strong. I have a yeah, feeling definitely. a bunch of people maybe just have an attention span that only lets them watch the first four or five minutes of the 15-minute presentation, the middle and back half of which has rich environments with lots of color and loads of diversity. Mm. So it's a funny little situation. And also, it's an interesting showing for the creation engine. So let's talk about that gameplay trailer because, uh. yeah, it's, it, you know, it is creation engine, but... I mean, ultimately, with an engine, what is an engine? It is just a set of tools. Um, I think a lot of people think about engines in a very monolithic way, um, but that's not necessarily how things are. Yeah, uh, so in this case, yeah. I think we're seeing the parts of the creation engine that have been very, you know, not very much updated. Um, I mean, in 76, had a lot of issues, but some aspects of, like, its lighting and uh, the actual creation tools for the world did seem to have went on quite far. Here we are seeing, yep, still oh. slightly dead eyes, yeah. but at least character models and animations that are well above what Bethesda usually does. Which is not to say they're fantastic, but it's well above what they usually do. Yeah, so I think the thing about the engine talk when it comes to that is very much, you know, people don't expect all Unreal Engine games to play the same. People don't expect all Unity games to play the same. People who think that or say that are very clearly told off immediately for thinking that way yeah and kind of corrected but for bethesda games it kind of comes down to the fact that obviously people are kind of aware of the like an engine doesn't necessarily inform how everything goes but in bethesda's case a lot of it is oh we can tell you've been using gamebryo you've been using the creation engine all of your games have had similar feel and similar problems they've had similar successes and how interactive the worlds can tend to be Especially thinking back to the Skyrim bucket on head shot people can't see. That's funny, but it is a cool interaction. Yeah, but that's the kind of thing that people. So has anyone really heard uh, anything like about this game? Like, does it seem worth checking out? Are y'all? I mean, uh, kind of. You know, talking about like, you know, I, I appreciate uh, good sci-fi, but you know, I I haven't heard anything about this. Is this is like just an expansion of No Man's Sky? which I've heard has gotten uh, pretty decent. Now I know it had a horrible start. Um, so, I mean, yeah, let me know down in chat, y'all, uh, what you think, what you've heard, how you feel. People will, like, rail on it more because of negativity bias, and then also they'll see, like, they'll watch Starfield and see, oh, I recognize, like, that bit of movement or that bit of button pressing or that bit of, like, how gunplay looks from Fallout 4. Oh, it's just going to be the same as Fallout 4. And that's not necessarily true, but it's kind of like a confirmation bias thing of seeing it and going, well, Fallout 4 was just a slightly better Fallout New Vegas, which was a slightly better Fallout 3 in terms of engine. So hmm. without actually being hands-on, people are kind of just sort of almost coerced by how everything actually is in the industry into assuming this is just going to be, oh, it's going to be a slightly better version of yeah. Fallout in space, which is just going to be down to the proof in the pudding, really. At the very least, it does immediately look significantly better visually oh it looks substantially better yeah. than what we're used to right like it, it it does look like a modern game so that's at least a good thing <laughs> um, yeah i, I suppose i hope so that. so a lot of this reminded me of essentially single player star citizen so much more uh, than okay i got it would say single player no man's sky mm. well, i guess the whole no man's sky multiplayer is its own thing um, but yeah, some aspects of the loop. So we start off uh, going to a rocky planet that's not particularly, you know, inhabited. And that's an interesting thing because I think for some people it's like, okay, well, it's not a beautiful, lush, super colorful world like you're going to get in No Man's Sky. Therefore, mm -hmm. it's bland and boring. 
But for a lot of people, especially when you kind of look at this, you know, where even they've positioned it this way, it's like, this is NASA. We are big fans of NASA. And that kind of like whole vibe and aesthetic, but significantly more in the future. And if you actually want to land that... Okay, cool. You know, ...emotional experience for a player who resonates with that, it does kind of have to feel like you are stepping onto a plausible, uninhabited, rocky planet. Hmm. Right? Like... So to, to me, so far, I really like the art direction. I really like how the worlds look. That is how... Yeah, I mean, he talks about modern, but yeah, look at the uh, fidelity. Like, it, there's a little, little small, like, you can see some, like, jagged edges, like, kind of on the backpack. Um, but the overall, like, I mean, if you're viewing out into the distance, like, right, you see that fog moving. How I would want them to look um, at a game like this. Um, just the barren, la the barren landscape. Honestly, I mean, it looks it looks really nice. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the kind of computer that can currently run this, uh, maybe in all low settings. But by and large, like this is, it looks it looks clean. So, if that's the only thing I pre I like about the game, then so be it. But uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll keep watching. We'll see if there's anything else. And when I like drop down to a place in, in Star Citizen to do a mission or like go to a POI or something, and one of the things that makes that feel cool is that it genuinely does look just like a world. So I guess that's one funny thing. Uh, there's like a lot of, um, you know, I'll just jump straight to it. Like the whole, um, you know, PC Gamer, Starfield is just ugly No Man's Sky, period. <laughs> and Ouch. I mean, PC Gamer, that totally just feels like you're doing a Kotaku style thing. Right? Like, that's pretty reductive. But then it's interesting because that just seems to be the shorthand of how people are actually now communicating about this game. Well, that's which is the then really, right? Which is then really funny because you actually look at the trailer and it's like, are people talking about some sort of lost jungle world with a big cool alien in it? <laughs> or like this more creepy scene of like, you know, alien creature like running through a corridor. Um, you know, the various different like towns, outposts. Oh, I put the same image in twice. Whoops. The more cyberpunkish looking area. So, yeah, it does seem to me that while we do have these like obviously big, you know, using procedural generation worlds. That there are locations that are more like Bethesda locations. Mm. So essentially, I would imagine that you're getting like a proper, you know, Bethesda style rich world sort of spread out across this but then a humongous amount of exploration content and stuff like that as you go around all these worlds. And it's like, yeah, a thousand worlds, that's more than you're probably ever going to uh, you know, really experience or whatever. Um, but one of the things when people are comparing, say, Outer Worlds to the Bethesda Fallout games is that, like, Outer Worlds kind of suffers a little bit from its scale, from not having, like, the big empty space. When you look at Skyrim, there's a lot of empty space <laughs> in Skyrim and playing for Oblivion. That empty space is really important to selling how that world feels. So yes. if you want to sell the overall... I mean, basically what he's getting at um, is, yeah, open world, open space, but also it has to make sense in the context, right? So Skyrim, right, it's in the, you know, the Nords, um, uh, you know, so basically big uh, Vikings, uh, all, all, that, all that good stuff, and... But a lot of it is like rolling tundras, um, some open plains, uh, like by White Run. So it makes sense that you have a lot of emptiness, right? It's, it's not jam packed with stuff. Um, it, it, again, it's you have to know, in to the extent of the environment, what makes sense, um, not to overdo it, right? Because sometimes if you clutter it too much, um, it. It takes away, uh, it takes away, and, and so it won't, you won't get that feeling that that environment is necessarily supposed to um, invoke. And that can kind of ruin, like, it's, it's almost like that little feeling of, like, uh, something feels off, may not be sure what exactly it is, but hey, it just, uh, something here is not, you know, meshing well together. Uh, so open space is a tactic, it's not always you know developers being lazy it's no there's usually a good reason behind why there's not always you know other stuff whether it be more trees bushes shrubs rock formations uh, caves outposts right it's typically there's a good reason and it, it all is supposed to flow together uh so and 
player can get a good sense of environments changing. All gameplay aesthetic as being this kind of like uh, NASA successor explorer, you do actually have to have a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> negative space, right? Yeah. It's just if stuff is everywhere, then finding stuff doesn't matter because you're always finding stuff. Yes, exactly. So That's another. Blend of to explore, you need to not find stuff sometimes. Really, that's kind of the point of it. I think <laughs> it sounds really simple when you think about it, but yeah, the whole point of exploring is to not find stuff, and then when you do find stuff, it feels good. The whole variable re reward scheduling thing in the brain as well does all that for you, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, to be honest, I thought it looked really cool. Like the idea I can just be in my custom made ship, and I'm going down to do something in a planet, and uh, I go down to that part of the planet, and you know, there <laughs> I am. What we'll have to see is, you know, is, you know, the position of, say, the sun or, you know, the star of, of whatever the, the system you're in, you know, is that accurate when you're actually down on world? Because all those things, say, Star Citizen does super well, really sell that you are truly in space. It's that thing. I know a lot of people have a lot of things to say about Star Citizen. Um, it does have many genuinely mind-blowing, like, holy fuck, I cannot believe this level of scale exists in a video game. <laughs> uh, moments when you you know, fly down to a city that just looks like it's Blade Runner or like a Coruscant or something. Um, or, you know, you, you go onto like some icy world and it just just feels like a real place and it's really cool. So if they can achieve that. And yeah, um, speaking of icy planets, that just reminds me, uh, Star Wars, the Old Republic, uh, the planet Hoth, right? Everyone knows Hoth. It's been in like every Star Wars series, I think pretty much every single one. Um classic snow planet uh but how they it's like you have your base installations and then a lot of times you know you even being on the speeder you're just going and it's nothing right it's just white snow you'll eventually come to another outpost or like a gorge um you know that's you know ice ice along the walls crystals um you have some like little volcanic activity just to change it up um but by and large, it is like that's where emptiness really kind of it invokes that feeling of like you're all alone out here in this like frozen tundra. And yeah, like I, it, it works exceptionally well. Again, it's knowing the environment, knowing what you're trying to um, kind of. Yeah, knowing what you're trying to, you know, uh, portray and get, really get that immersive feeling. Um, that's how you know you've done a good job. Uh, well, I'll play your feedback, I guess, obviously. Um, but it's like, does this, you know, does not having stuff here, does having stuff here, does that really, you know, let people perceive what we're trying to get them to with regards to this environment? Um, like, am I feeling like, like, oh my God, this is like, it's a lot to take in. It's breathtaking, captivating. It's like empty. Like there's nothing. It's like, no one's out here, you know, like no one's here to help you kind of thing. And that in part is part of exploration. It makes it fun in video games. And then get all of the best bits of the Bethesda, mostly first person role-playing game. I think that's going to be super strong. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think it's so much of what you actually feel in terms of the actual fantasy is very hard to sell in a thriller. And I think that's what, you know, cutting everything away from what people actually like about Bethesda games, because obviously there's people like lots of different small things about them, and, you know, you'll have different answers from everyone. But I think if you boil down all the answers into, like, a kind of singular point, it would all just be people like Skyrim, they like Oblivion, they like Morrowind, they like Fallout New Vegas 3, 4... Not sure how mm -hmm. people like for comparatively, but generally speaking, it's about <laughs> yeah. the fantasy, right? Yeah. It's about the kind of immersive sin light in the kind of more RPG setting where you do get of interactions, you do get to kind of live out the fantasy of whatever you're trying to play. Not in the most detailed way. It's not to the same point as like a Deus Ex is like super tightly uh, kind of molded in every way, but it's more kind of an open world version of that. And a more kind of <laughs> here's a couple of systems that you can interact with that feel kind of real. I was like, actually selling that to people seemed to be the really hard part. Yeah. Because it's like, people can only really think in terms of, especially like the general gaming 
uh, like populace on Twitter and even like journalists and stuff, it's very hard for them to think about the overall fantasy when they don't see it or they're not playing. It's like you have to look at it from the yeah. kind of objective standpoint of what have we seen in this trailer and they don't feel anything that's good about it. Mm -hmm. You can see all the things that are happening. But that's been completely overridden by this massive, massive, just engorged bias in the back of their head, which is, this is a Bethesda game. It's going to be jank. They have made a good one in ears. And that's the kind of thing that... Ah, uh, okay. Um, that is a good point, right? Uh, it'd be hypocritical to say, like, uh, to disagree. Because, uh, right, that's what we were just talking about with the whole Diablo, right, uh, 4 being impacted by Diablo Immortal people's trusts aren't going to be there. So you haven't, right? You just produced a massive POS and you, ex and now you're saying like, oh, well, this one's going to be great. You're going to love it. It's like, well, why, why would I trust you at this point? Why would I believe that this will be different? Um, so to that extent, yeah, you know, uh, Bethesda not producing any great game in recent years. Um, hard to say how far it goes back. I haven't, again, I haven't played rpg in a while i mean i love skyrim obviously um i actually liked i know elder scrolls online was Zenimax, um so i don't know how much influence bethesda actually had in it i'm sure you know they gave them the okay on some things um because elder scrolls online was uh great storytelling uh i liked most of the expansions uh gray more i think um with the werewolves was disappointing and some of the zones i was very uh yeah i d they did not buy it but all in all like great uh over overall good storytelling so i'm trying to think of what else bethesda's done i know i'm leaving one out um but anyways y'all get the point right is like you haven't put out anything good in years why all of a sudden would we believe that you would do that now? I mean, it, I think, it happens. Like Blizzard was saying recently with Diablo 4 having some kickback from Immortal, it's like people oh, there you go. are sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. I think it's a matter of magnitude of how much that bias is there or how much that like existing opinions are. But people are like, it's a Bethesda game, I'm going to have to play it before I see it. It's, you know, I don't trust this to be super really well magically put together. Yeah. Is it just going to be a load of yeah, I've slapped together a bunch of quests. Yeah, th there's every chance that they could really bungle it with that. And yeah. then stuff could get boring. So to kind of go into some more of the gameplay elements Ooh, there. good looking sandwich. Movement seems to be impacted by gravity, so I think that'll be cool as you're going just, you know, different planets, moons, things like that. Um, can offer up some fun gunplay. Mm. Like, like the whole thing of, you know, the bit in the trailer where you're basically like, you know, using your jetpack. It's kind of like raining down hell on people. It's destiny. That seems kind of cool. <laughs> um, right, so then the combat side. If not for the enemies looking slightly like a bullet sponge, mm. I think it would have been a strong enough showing because the animations were just fine. It, it just looks like it's not quite done yet. But mm. then, of course, it's Bethesda combat, so I imagine it is going to shape exactly as we saw it. Yeah, it's going which to be Which probably means it's going to be better than Fallout 4, and 4 was better than... This was better than New Vegas, and New Vegas was better than 3. Not that New Vegas was even made by them, but you know what I mean. Uh, so I think it's probably going to oh. be the best gunplay in a Bethesda game. Not that that. Is yeah, um, I, I I do see what they're meaning. It's that's one thing we talked about in recent games. Like people want their hits, um, whatever, like to seem impactful. Uh, so like Destiny Two, uh, it, like as far as FPS goes, Destiny Two I think does that pretty well, right? Like you shoot someone in the shoulder, and like you know uh, they might. Uh, like, you know, act as if they actually just got shot in the shoulder. It's like, hey, that makes me feel like my shot matters. Um, as compared to uh, what Belly Lar said, uh, you know, a, a bullet sponge, because you saw him, he was shooting that guy running at him, and nothing was happening until he died. Again, it makes you feel like, oh, this gun's not powerful, right? I guess unless you're one-shotting people. Um, so I do, I do agree with that. That's kind of a letdown. That is particularly saying much. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? It's But we'll just get the job done. Yeah, because people go, okay, well, you say the gunplay in 4 was better. 
And that might be very much literally true in terms of how everything kind of feels mechanically speaking. Mm. But then people think, well, you know, maybe the balance wasn't quite right for Fallout 4 or I couldn't build my character that I wanted to. So I didn't like the combat quite as much. And that's the thing where it doesn't matter how good or bad Bethesda make a game. It's about can they, be, can they recreate the feeling people had playing Skyrim. Because obviously, you know, everyone who plays Skyrim will still swear up and down it's a bad game. Oh, it's awful and, combat, and, yeah. And right, like, <laughs> rightly so, everyone's always looked at Bethesda games. Maybe less so Morrowind because it was so far ahead of its time in a bunch of ways. But people go, yeah, these are <laughs> genuine, like, these are badly implemented games in a whole bunch of ways. But none of that matters. But people kind of continually forget that or aren't able to think about it in a way. So it's like, it doesn't matter if it's actually better if it doesn't have that special thing. Yeah, like, And hey, that's where the whole discourse around Bethesda games is so confusing. Mass Effect Andromeda. Awesome yeah. combat. Ooh, um, great game. Funny enough, there are similarities between this game and Mass Effect Andromeda, where originally in Andromeda, they wanted to have way more planets and to use procedural generation. Mm. So it's quite interesting that for them it failed, but evidently they at least think they've got it to work <laughs> here. Yeah. And now, of course, uh, there's some lockpicking, you know, little pattern games. Uh, we also notice there's some faction-based gameplay. You can join one of the three main factions, which quite broadly are exploration, military, and then piracy. Um, and there's an ongoing plot thread, basically alien artifacts and visions kind of makes us think of Mass Effect, uh, but we will see. Um, and then, of course, the range of uh, environments, right? Like, here's just a few shots from the trailer. I mean, and I think you know, people obviously saw the more, like, barren planet. I feel like they started with the barren planet because they wanted to make it feel like just a bit of genuine exploration. I mean, that's cool to have, like, different factions. Um, again, to add some, hopefully, like, uniqueness. Like, it changes what maybe quests are up to you or like you know i think overall that would be a good uh choice i i'm kind of so thought up of like you know based on like how the game's designed thus far how that's going to really fit into it all um pros and cons this is a interesting looking dinosaur bird rhino moose thing going so cool uh, you know, something like that. Uh, but yeah, so we've got this, like, jungly one. Um, there's, like, different sort of towns, cities. Uh, one of them's got, like, a sort of cyberpunk-ish look to it. There's, like, there's a shot of this town here that just, it's more like a sort of, sort of more rich and vibrant. I think there's, like, some purple or whatever in it. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go, right? It just seems to be that pretty big game. Now, there's kind of, like, two interesting points. Um, there's a callback to, uh, well, sort of, like, two things. Um, one of them is a mortgage, just being able to get like a you know, fifty thousand credit uh, mortgage, a you know small house and a peaceful little moon. That is a reference, of course, to Daggerfall. Hmm. And then also a very interesting trait is a serpent's embrace, right? So if you decide your character is going to be a follower of the Great Serpent, which is basically a religion, it means that you've got basically an uncontrollable uh, impulse to jump, right? So. Basically, if uh, navigating one of the game's planets, you continue to use your uh, boosters to grab jump, uh, it will temporarily boost your health and your endurance. But if you don't jump, the serpent will be displeased and that will you know, lower your core stats. So it seems like they're kind of using this like little religion angle to get some more interesting perks and traits, huh. which will be fun. Uh, that sounds a little uh, <laughs> sketchy. So my character is going to be randomly jumping um, as I'm playing throughout the game. I mean, yes, bonus points to uniqueness and uh, for sure having your choice matter, right? That's definitely very Bethesda-esque. Um, this is an odd one. Hope there's more. For people's role playing. Yeah, that fully screams New Vegas to me. Yeah, that, and that's what we want to hear. Yeah, that's yeah. the wacky shit. That's the kind of stuff <laughs> that makes these games historically feel so interesting. And I feel like a little bit of that was lost with Fallout 4 and a little bit of that was kind of lost with Skyrim as well where Oblivion was a lot wackier. And the kind of the wackiness scales kind of went down a little bit over time. But it looks like, at least in terms of how the religions are there, they do know they do want to have some really crazy shit that's kind of super memorable. But also kind of like, you don't want this to be a completely serious role-playing situation. Almost no games ever really are. They always have that sense of, yeah, this is, let's see what we can do with this. What's super memorable? And I think that's the case of, you know, hopefully, hopefully this all manifests correctly. Hopefully this isn't just like uh, exceptions to prove the rule. 
about mm. anything else because I think one of the things people are rightly afraid of when it comes to games, especially when it comes to procedural generation, is the often used term just soulless. Yeah. And that's a lot of what people are afraid of, of these big games getting bigger, these games getting made by, you know, AI as opposed to people. Obviously, that's literally not true. It's just using AI to fill bits in. But it's like, that's... Well, I think that's, the, the that's, thing that's, is, Soul can be there. It just needs to be actually, like, you know... Ultimately, if they want to do the fantasy of you land on the planet Mars yeah. and do something, what's the yeah. point in handcrafting the entire... Of, like, and if they want that to be somewhere where you can just go anywhere in Mars... Yeah. Like, I know there's differences in different parts mm. of Mars... But for the most part, you can proceed yeah. to generate that. <laughs> so if the, the proc chain's good enough, then yeah, you just get a planet. And I think in that case, it's not like they'd be intending for this planet to be like a humongous, mega rich, you know, crazy place to go and explore. It's like, well, no, you drop in, drop out to this planet. Um, and a part of what makes that a cool experience is that it quite literally is a massive big planet. Uh, yeah. That you know that there is that space there. You know that. So I wonder if it'd be, uh, you know, there have been some games where uh, these open openness where people or guilds, um, clans, what have you, can uh, purchase land to like build houses and stuff. So, you know, they talked about that fifty thousand uh, credits for a small home. Like, is that is that something like you build? Like, you'll physically be able, like, you have to physically travel to. And can people build homes like right around you? So like on a whatever planet, you can more or less come to the, these player made cities or more realistically, it's going to be player made, like just all these housing units, which is usually not very pretty. Um, like, is that what's going to be presented? Um, I'm having I'm having a little trouble uh, wrapping my head around that whole aspect. I. Uh, I, I'll let y'all know what I think at the end of the video. It's that scale, like within the game. You don't need to explore all of it. It exists there to serve the fantasy in the same mm. way that having big open spaces in an MMO zone can make an MMO, zo an MMO zone actually feel more like a real place. Mm. Right? Comparing some of World of Warcraft's older zones that were bigger, had more open space, to some of the newer ones that have just been so dense and full of gameplay that they no longer feel like places. So really, it's like, what's the procedural gen generation used for? Is it so that the backdrop of a lot of what you do is this really awesome scale and that's what makes it feel real? Well, then what's the problem? Now, the problem then is if they use this procedural generation and then they think this means, okay, we threw mm. a gradient questing system and now we have infinite content. That's the problem, yeah. Which, which is the worry. And that's what I think that's what a lot of people would expect because that's, that's how modern game development feels to people. It's infinite content that's all the same. Mm -hmm. what, what purpose does it serve? Not not necessarily to waste your time, but to kill your time. Yeah. It, I think lots of people are going to be a little bit of people. Uh, you're just slapping a new coat of paint on it, right? It, it, same stuff, just looks a little different. Coming into this, because it's been a long time since, since Skyrim's Radiant AI questing was really transparently pointless. <laughs> will it be substantially better now? Or will it not? I guess that's the... That's the big thing. That's the big thing. Yeah, just that. How do they actually make the content? Yeah. What's what's going to, what's the framing going to be? Like the radiant system itself, pretty boring. But if you were to tie the radiant quest system into a dynamic civil war system with what some mods have created for Skyrim, yeah. then suddenly it could be interesting. It's like, okay, you do enough radiant driven civil war quests, you do you do a whole bunch of those, push the enemy back, then you unlock a new siege or something to do. Like then that sort of thing can fall into a broader game system that's more uh, you know, that is a bit more engaging. Or, you know, you say if this, I don't know if this is the case, but if it had more of a simulated economy and then you could do a few quests in an area that would change some of the market, then you could sell some things. Like, that's the sort of emergent gameplay that could come out. We just don't know if it will yet. And I guess if we go to some of the... Oh, yeah, one final thing before community reactions. Uh, you are a silent protagonist. Conversations are first person. So they very much seen what they did in Fallout 4 didn't work. Good. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that ties works. into what uh, Todd said at the very opening. It was like I think there's a little bit of a reel of like the main story stuff, and then him on stage saying, "Ultimately, it's not our story; it's the story you create by who you are and the choices you make," which is very much them going, "Yeah, whoops, we for we kind of forgot that was what our <laughs> games were about. Sorry about that. This next game will be like that. Please enjoy." 
which is, you know, I don't know if Tartar's ever e- even quite as uh, subtly admitted to a mistake they've made before. Yeah, yeah. So as for the community reactions, pretty simple. No yeah. Man's Starfield. It's a No Man's Skyrim job. Looks like a combination mm-hmm. of No Man's Sky Fallout and a bit of Mass Effect. Um, yeah, I mean, look, that's the easiest, you know, communicate with some examples, I suppose. Um, now that said, for them, that could mean they are maybe getting some <laughs> more negative connotations to some of those things, mm-hmm. which obviously kind of sucks for them, but it is on them to actually prove that this is all worth it. Um, I mean, taking like the, you know, Lana Pierce's uh, reaction, which I think is a pretty common one, also did humongously the rounds. Uh, I might be alone, but my near immediate reaction to there are a thousand planets is way more concerned than hype. I'm mm-hmm. excited to play it for a bunch of reasons, but a thousand just makes me think, okay, most of that's very barren or I don't have time for that. And then I guess from my perspective as somebody who's more of a fan of space games, because I really like space games, it's like, well, I would never expect to be asked to fully explore all of these planets. For me, it's just, this is community. This is a thing you do to truly make it feel like you are in space and it has scale. Yeah. You then just have to make a good game within that. Yeah, but then I think it's because the Thousand Planets has been used kind of as a marketing beat. Mm-hmm. And it's, the gamers are very much trained to go, I know you're trying to sell me something. I don't think I like what you're trying to sell me. <laughs> and that's kind of the problem of... <laughs> And I may not know what it is, but I don't like really, it. It's really very difficult. I think my reaction is most Sims. A thousand planets? Cool. Oh. I don't give a shit. Why, why should I give a shit if you've got a thousand planets worth of content? Because that sounds to me like you haven't made a thousand planets worth of really, really good content because that's too much for you to make in one game. Well, it's like in Which is then, you know, there's all the, like, what you're saying, but it doesn't all have to be content. It can be backdrop. You're like, yeah, that completely fine. Completely 100%. That would be great. But do... Does a modern gamer mm. trust them not to stick quest markers all over every 1,000 planet? And like, oh, un- uncover the map by walking around all these 1,000 planets for five achievement points? <laughs> which is then on the side of your screen every time you Worth play it. forever? I mean, I'd imagine not. Yeah, I'd imagine not. But it's that's like, that's like, like the worst fear people uh, have. Yeah. Like they've made big cities. <laughs> yeah. And seemingly they've like made intricate play spaces. Man. Like what yeah. you would expect from a game that is made by them. Yeah, so it's course. like because they've done that, does that not sort of inform us as to what's going on with all of these planets? I'm not sure because uh, we have some really space seen combat. Those people are just thinking about Preston Garvey saying another settlement needs your help. Yeah, and yeah, obviously that's going to feel weird. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and, and like uh, honestly, okay. do you expect them to do anything really different? I would very much hope not because it seems like a very silly thing to do. But at the same time, I think the entirety of modern gaming has had that kind of push of. We know you can make content to fill our time. We now want higher quality stuff. We don't want the equivalent of extremely cheaply made video game fast food. People still do want that in a lot yeah. of cases. And there's a whole discourse over people going, well, no, I want loads of game for my money. I want to have like a couple hundred hours in like Horizon Forbidden West. I don't want an mm-hmm. eight, eight hour story experience for $70. Go away. And the person that says, like, uh, but I have limited time. <laughs> And that's kind of like the split across gamers in general. And that's where this discourse is getting kind of uh, almost, I don't want to say uncivil, but almost in that sense of there's two people with very different or two types of people with very different ones. And then you put that on Twitter or on Reset Era or on Reddit or wherever else. And it just gets basically a bloodbath. Yeah, because like in, in my head, yeah. this is a game that looks like it has like ship customization that is really cool. Mm-hmm. Yes. Forms of progression, building your character. Guns, that really all that. Cool. Honestly, that space combat looks amazing to me. Uh, big hubs with, you know, characters, factions, and all of the stuff yeah. that you, you know, the genu- genuinely is the good thing in these games. That that's all there. And then we're kind of like dipping in and out to all these planets, exploring them, exploring space. Like, there you to go. me, that pretty cool. much seems perfect. Uh, be- if you want the exploration thing. To really be like a core vibe of this game uh but i think evidently a lot of people are going to need a lot of convincing in this one i mean that's exactly it where i would love to be able to look at what they're offering go oh yeah i completely trust todd hard to give me a tremendous experience it's going to be you know a couple it's going to be very much worth my money and it'll be high quality the whole way through and none of it i mean yeah it's like I, I'm glad they showed that like the house customization, gun customization. Like uh, I think a game like this is going to really thrive off of, off of having these different uh, forms of customization building uh, because that's going to really give players 
some own like personal active goal. Right? It's like, why is it worth me going to one of these thousand uh, planets? Because I, I do agree with the skepticism. Bigger doesn't always mean better, right? So a thousand planets, you know, I talked a lot about environment. Like, you know, having bare and empty space can be very powerful. It can be very um, uh, useful to, you know, again, invoking a certain feeling um, and attitudes towards an environment. However, if that's like 90% of these, you know, in this case, these planets that you go to are like that kind of same, well, it there's a reason I said it. it's like oh same thing just you know uh, a new coat of paint slapped on it and that gets old incredibly fast it will feel cheap and there'll be no bugs because they'll have a QA team working on this QA forever but I think most people going this is going to be this is going to release so full of bugs it'll be basically unplayable wow. is I think most people's kind of default assumption yeah and that's not even like coming with like a load of like oh well we fuck Bethesda and that is literally just people go oh yeah that's that's how it is that's how it is. So there's a huge mm. amount of work to kind of get rid of that. But I think another thing is this is like, I'd say Fallout 4, this is Bethesda's first like single player game release since Skyrim or so. I was saying Fallout 4, yeah. Yeah. It's, the industry's a little bit different 11 years later. Yeah. Well, it'll be 12 years later by the time this out. Or mm. almost yeah, about. So it's like, are they making a game that they've been designing since before Elden Ring came out? You know, are, are the tastes and changes of what an open world and procedure generation and RPG are, are they going to be any different? Are people going to have higher standards than they did a couple of years ago even because of what they've seen? Undoubtedly. And will Bethesda be able to actually kind of have a game that's strong enough in that regard? I certainly hope so. And they wouldn't delay it if they thought it was going to come out out of date. It's not like they're like, oh, we'll just make Skyrim in space and call it a day. It's going to take 10 years. Do you think it's going to change? No. Nah. So I do, I do have a decent amount of trust in their core design, their core tenets, their core pillars. And a lot of what they've shown has kind of proven that to me. Especially in terms of like how that space combat looks. That looks like something that... Mm -hmm. <laughs> if that was tried... If they tried to implement that in the existing like Fallout 4 engine, it probably would explode. It definitely <laughs> wouldn't work. But I still see people making fun of the Fallout 3 train. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the... was it? Star Wars Squadrons? Uh, very sensitive, like... You know, at least here in this, like, first-person view, you know, just being able to zoom around. So, I mean, that, there's that. Uh, so if you enjoyed that, then, you know, this might be a perk. Being an NPC's hat. So that's kind of the legacy they have to shake. Yeah. They have to shake that legacy, and hopefully all the time they spent working this is enough to do that. Well, on the very bright side, they've delayed it. Yeah. That should mean more polish time, more bug-fixing time. Uh, I mean, who knows that they're owned by Microsoft now. Maybe Microsoft are just more willing to so. delay stuff than maybe would have happened in the past. Because sure as hell, like <laughs> Skyrim PS3, that shouldn't have been launched. <laughs> like that was a mistake, right? Yeah, <laughs> even 76, what, yeah. 76 shouldn't have been launched. We did more work. Yep. Um, perhaps the time afforded to them will actually pay off. Because I mean, if this comes out and they just kind of really nail that launch. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would just be incredible for Bethesda because mm -hmm. it's not like they usually nail launches in terms of sales, but not always in terms of it being a you know great product by some sort of quality standards. Yeah, there's that cynical, evil bastard inside me going, I hope this releases and is a complete dumpster fire. No. I want a Crobacad video on this that's <laughs> like that's like an hour and a half long. I want, uh, was it Joseph Anderson did the four hour video in Fallout 76 Bugs? I think so. I want a 12 hour one of those, Jesus, but. The other part of me is going, man, I hope this comes out and is absolutely fantastic. Because it's, it's just, it's not good form to wish a little game, really. Yeah, yeah, and even just selfishly, like, this is absolutely, like, you know, top level, kind of like my perfect game. Yeah. And for so many other people like me, I know it is the same. God, you're insane. That's why I, yeah, I like space. I like oh. exploration, building <laughs> ships. Uh, the faction stuff like that is totally up my alley. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, man, I hope they pull it off. But certainly a quick uh, look through the internet does show that, uh, you know, shorthand communication via blasting, you know, just little blurts of meaning, like Starfield is just an ugly No Man's Sky. Mm -hmm. It does show that, yeah, you open yourself up to comparison, reduction, and ridicule 
a hell of a lot. And uh, it's just interesting how things spread a little bit more differently now than they used to in the past. Absolutely. But I suppose, I mean, even for that, like PC Gamer needs clicks. Like they, they did one article just being like, there's no way any of this is interesting. And then another article saying, I hope the Thousand Planets are actually boring. Oh, yeah. That's, that's evidently somebody who's just like the writer there thinking like, no, I actually, yeah, I, I want the NASA dude flying about trying to find a cool thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's been, what some people genuinely want from the game. That's been the PC Gamer standard recently. It is take games discourse, have one editor do an op-ed or one writer other do an op-ed on, you know, one side of the coin. And then shortly after, have another person do an op-ed on the other side of the coin. And as far as I can tell, it is completely genuine that it is just like staff members with differences of opinion. And it does have the ultimate effect that PC Gamer kind of play both sides, but from the individual viewpoint of the, the writers. So it is like, basically, it's almost like the good way to look at it. You go, oh, what are some people saying? What are other people saying? Yeah. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Or at least here's two fears or two assumptions that you have to work on. Because I think we're... we're <laughs> It's actually quite annoying. I mean, it's good for all of the... Uh, you the don't mind, say. But it's definitely... It's a long time from... Is the game good? What's the game out of a 10? Is it a 7 or an 8? It's an 8. I'll go buy it. We've certainly come a long way since then. <laughs> now it's... Here's 47 essays on what a video game could mean to you. Or what its impact on the future of video games could have. Before anyone's allowed to buy it. <laughs> God, I love it. That's how it's changed. Uh, but okay, uh, let me know what you think about Starfield. That's it for us lots more gaming stuff to talk about soon so see us next time um okay so my uh my two cents on the game are i mean in part to be fair uh personal bias aside i i'm uh, this whole exploration stuff no man's sky i'm not really my uh cup of tea i do enjoy sci-fi i do enjoy a uh, good old space game right uh but yes i i do agree about all the worries like the thousand planets the you know is this game going to be buggy when it launches because it is quite quite a lot to try and accomplish uh you know before you know they release it they're doing a lot and a lot of it seems cool um one of the biggest things that bugs me i might be over um you know dwelling on it is the whole enemies right anything you're shooting and it's like your bullets have no effect on it until it dies that to me is like uh, you want me to upgrade all this you know the game you want me to upgrade my gun and do all this kind of stuff and it doesn't seem like yeah it kills it faster but uh it's just not very impactful so like in its current state after just watching all this and yeah listening to them it's, it's this game were to come out i i i have even right now, I have zero desire to play it. Um, I just don't, you know, and I have um, had, have it, hard to say, but a lot of respect for Bethesda. So to not really be getting anything what seems to be worthwhile, um, that's unfortunate. You know, um, it is what it is. So <laughs> there you go, the Starfield um, drama, or aka the No Man's Skyrim right uh a lot of people are worried um and i think rightfully so uh hopefully again rooting for a victory um for bethesda but you know I, I think time will tell updates and you know just hopefully when they launch it doesn't you know release broken because that would just be devastating to the company all right well, that's going to wrap it up for me, everyone. I'm uh, going to take a short break and hope to be on later. Um, again, as always, I'm your host, Dr. Duality. Thank you all for checking it in. Um, you know, again, please uh, follow, check out the YouTube, like, subscribe, all that good jazz. Uh, super helpful. Really appreciate it. Um, great chatting. So I hope to see you all later. Um, as always, you all take care.